Today's interview is with Theo Garin, a good, he's a good friend of mine. Um, Theo and I have been to so many uh, sporting events, um, him as a journalist and myself in the public relations field. Theo um, has, has been involved in sport for longer than when I've been alive. He's, he was initially a player as a kid to go on to become a teacher, um, then uh, a coach, a manager, um, a finally a reporter and a big fan of school and junior sports. They have seen most of South Africa's top, top uh, sportsmen um, as little kids from under 11, 12, 13 years old all the way up to getting to matric their final years of school and seen what they've done at school and how they've got on from there to become international players. In, in South Africa we've got a tournament called uh, the Craven Week. He's been to more Craven Weeks than even Donny Craven who the tournament's been named after. Theo's been to cricket tournaments, water polo tournaments, hockey tournaments, male and female um, in all um, sports. Um, he's been to sports with um, differently abled kids and reported on and seen pretty much everything that, that um, sport has to produce. He's seen some of the top um, sportsmen in South Africa um, play. He's seen some top players in, in world football like Giovanni Dos Santos play in the Dunar Nations Cup. Where he's seen people like Zinedine Zidane and he's got to see um, you know, just some of the top, top, top sportsmen around the country. So it'll be interesting to, to hear from Theo what he thought about sport before the coronavirus, what he thinks is going to change because of the coronavirus, and how he sees the future of sport in, in South Africa and sport in the world. So Theo, um, you've been involved in sport for, for many, many years. How did you get involved in sport and um, how did you choose sport? Because you start off as a teacher, so how did you get involved in sport? Well, when I was a teacher in those days, particularly as a teacher, you were expected to coach. So I got into coaching the two games that I, I had played as a, as a kid, water polo and rugby. And uh, I then sort of stumbled into the newspaper world, even while I was teaching. I ended up being a, a freelance columnist for the Star, writing about school sport. Uh, that, that's um, an interesting story. It, it was, in fact, Graham Joffe, Joffers, who was a, uh, who I taught at Highlands North Boys High, who when he left um, school ended up going to the Star and offering his service to, services to them to write about school sport because he had six months to spare before he went off overseas on a on a scholarship, and uh, he then did it for a year and then he left to go to Switzerland on this Rotary Exchange program, and they asked him if he knew someone who would take it over, and then he came to me and so I became the school sport guy at the start while I was still teaching. And I did that for a good five or six years. And then eventually I left and went to the start full time and I left teaching. And school sport was the area that I started off with, writing about. And I carried on doing it in all my years at the start, although I did other things as well. And uh, I guess until I retired in 2016. And since then I've been dabbling, as you know, doing some stuff for guys like you, I've been doing stuff for, for various websites. So in a way, I've still been keeping my hand in on a sort of freelance basis. So, I mean, in, in school sport itself, you've gone from pretty much being a coach to a manager to um, managing high performance teams, let's say, or, or your provincial teams at, at various provincial weeks and, and multiple sports to eventually writing about it. How, how did that journey go for you? Yeah, you know, I was always, I was always, I guess my my leanings. Although I was a coach, and I and I and I went, you know, I coached the first team at school. I coached the, the, the Transvaal those days, Craven Week rugby team. I coached uh, uh, Transvaal water polo teams. I was appointed SA schools coach at, at one time for water polo. So I did quite well as a coach. Uh, but but my leaning was always towards administration. I became a referee. I got onto the board of Karting of Transvaal schools rugby those days and water polo, um, and so and so I took the sort of route of of administration, uh, selection, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that that was my involvement in sport, and 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 that, that carried on for a long time beyond after when after I stopped sort of coaching at the top level, and then I went into the newspaper, and by then my mind is pretty was pretty much set, my philosophy of what school sport should be about was based on that experience of being a teacher and being an administrator at the sort of high performance level and uh, and running mass sport as a as a as a board member for the various school sports associations and uh, that sort of molded me into my, my thinking and then I went to the star where I was a school sports 
reporter eventually, initially, and then eventually they they asked me to to have my own school sport publication in the Saturday Star, which ran for a couple of years. And at that stage, I then decided now I'm going to start expressing my opinion more forcefully, and I, I started a column in that um, in that Saturday Star school sport thing, in which I would every week sound off on whatever was on my mind, and. Uh, and I found I enjoyed that, and, and it got quite a lot of traction. And then I, when I left the store, I, I then decided to become a blogger, and I carried on doing the same thing. So I've sort of got into a situation now where once a week or every two weeks, I, I go off on some issue that's bagging me. And, it's, and, and there's so many things wrong, in my view, that, uh, that there's always something to whinge about. And it's usually about rugby, and it's usually about this whole win at all cost. Uh, attitude that is into school rugby and other sports, and uh, you know that's that's basically how I got where I am now. You know, I'm now I've got the grey hair and uh, the experience and the years, which makes me believe I've got the I've got the the right now to have an opinion. You know, obviously people don't have to agree with me; they don't have to listen to me. I, you know, I guess in a way, it's a hobby. I do it for my own satisfaction and, and to keep busy. I think um, for a lot of journalists, they, they actually might get into the, the, the journalism work by starting off in school sport. Within a, a year or two, they, 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 they use it as a platform to go elsewhere, but you've never really done that because guys like you, um, we've got Hannes, we've got other, a couple of other journalists around in South Africa, there are very, very few of them, um, Khaled maybe, that are very passionate about school sports. So you've actually stayed there and you've got to know a lot more about school sport. That, would that come more from your um, being a teacher kind of background and your passion for kids or where would that come from? Yeah, definitely. I think I, I, I was drawn to school sports and I decided to stay in it. And I did have the odd opportunity to move into other things, uh, but I decided to stay there because it was keeping me involved with schools. I'd obviously made a lot of friends and acquaintances and uh, amongst the teachers and, and at the schools. And, uh, and, I, and they were, you know, they were the people that I enjoyed and, and I enjoyed going to school events. And, and, and it allowed me through all those years in the, in the, the 22 odd years that I worked for this, 23 years that I worked for the star, I still regarded myself as a teacher in many ways. I, I considered myself that my role was education. And I tried to do that via the, the sort of things that I was doing in, in the, as a school sport journalist. And uh, I never had really had the ambition to go to uh, go into into senior sport. It was just wasn't the same thing as far as I was concerned. So, um, I mean, in, in that period of time, you've seen a lot of guys go on to, um, you know, to to actually make it in senior sport. Um, You've actually got your, um, you, you wrote at the beginning of 2020, your, your top 10, um, what's it, rugby players that you'd seen and your top 10 schools and your top 10 moments in, in sport over the last decade. Um, do you have any couple, a couple of little highlights that you can talk about? Yeah, well, you know, I, that was something that I started when I was at the Saturday Star. You know, in newspapers, you, that was, became a common practice at the end of the year when things got quiet then you, we'd call it the silly season and you'd start drawing up these lists. There have been so many of them during this lockdown, it's become a bit of a ball, you know, the top, top this and top that. So I, I decided at one stage to, uh, to go back over all the years that I'd, uh, that I'd been covering. And remember, I went, I went to the Craven Week in 78 and 79 as, as manager 78, coach 79 of the Transvaal uh, schools team. And I basically, and then the, the next year was the year that I started at the Star as a, as a freelancer. So I've basically been, with, it, with one or two exceptions, I've been to every Craven Week since then. And I've been to every Kaima Jola Week or the Nuffield Week since then as well. Again, with the odd, you know, with the odd exception. And so I, I don't think there's anyone around who's seen more um, of those sort of weeks. And because you write about them, you always write about the standout players. So guys, stick stuck in your mind. So I thought it'd be quite interesting to go back and, and have a look and, and draw up my top 10 player, Craven Week rugby players, for example. I mean, I can't remember the, them offhand, but uh, I think that the, the, um, maybe the interesting thing there, and, and, and I'm not the only person who's, who has this view, 
is that the best, the best Craven Week rugby player I saw in all those years was Herschel Gibbs, who ended up being a, a, a top cricket, world-class cricketer, obviously. He was just in a class of his own. He's the guy who really stands up over that period of time. Um, and there have obviously been others, and, and many of them have gone on to, 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 be, to be Springboks. Uh, Joe van Niekerk was another one who, who really stood out, who as a schoolboy rugby player was just way above his peers. He, you know, he, was, he was a man amongst boys. Um, Ruben Kruger was the same in, at Grey College. Um, so through the years, those are the sort of people I've spoken about. In the cricket, the cricket scene, it's the same. I think, uh, you know, you and I have been to all those many cricket weeks together, and the guy who probably stands out in all of that would be Chris Rabada. Just the impact that he made in the week that he was at. But of course, all the top players, you know, the Graham Smiths and, and uh, J.P. Duman, he's all played at, at those weeks as well. The cricket, I think, has a very, a very big uh, throughput. You know, a lot of the guys who, who go to those weeks end up playing top. In fact, the, all the guys who play top, top cricket have been at that week. Rugby, maybe not so much. I think you get guys who, who you do get guys who, who didn't go to Crave Week at all who make it eventually. And that's because of different rates of, uh, of, of physical development. You know, they developed, they grew, they got big later on. And of course, the big problem was selection. Uh, because that's one of the issues that I often whinge about is that uh, selection is not fair. And uh, if you're at a certain school, you will get selected. And if you're another school, you've got a very little chance of, of choosing or becoming part of the team unless you've got a Unless you've got a, you know, unless you've got someone on the on the committee who can speak for you, it was interesting. Uh, you spoke about Hannes Nina, but he he put you know he puts up these teams from certain years, and he put up the the free state. Did you see that the free state? Nuffield week, I suppose it was still the team from. No, in fact, it was the Craven Week team, Craven Week rugby team from the the Craven Week '99 in Durban, uh, of which 13 or 14 of the guys were. From Grey College, and uh, two from Saint Duplessis and one from from uh, J from uh, well, J B Edzo is it Edzo? From H T S Louis School. H T S Louis Berta, maybe. Yeah, yeah, Louis Louis Berta, yeah. Mm. And uh, and that that sort of thing happened all the time. And one of the guys, one guy from Saint Duplessis, happened to be Franco Smith. No, he wasn't at Gray. His father was a principal of, of, of St. Duplessis, so that's where the school he went to. Uh, but he was a reserve. He played most of the games because Nicky Boyer got injured. But he was selected as a reserve. He wasn't the first choice player. And then he went, he played two and a half games of reserve as a reserve and set a Craven Week point scoring record. At the end wow. of that year, he went, to the, he went to the Nuffield Week in Cape Town, playing for the Passmore 11, which was a sort of invitation development type team. And he scored the most runs at the week. He didn't make the Free State cricket team. It was all 13 of them were from Grey College. Now, okay, Grey College is brilliant, great school, the, the top sporting school in the country. So that's not, there's nothing too much wrong with that. But you have a look at, at, at Gauteng teams, and you look at, the, and look at the players who selected, and look at the manager and the coach and know where they come from, as I do. And, you, and, and there's always a pattern. The players who are in the team are there because they had a selector or a coach or a manager. And they were good. But they wouldn't have got there. They wouldn't have been noticed if they hadn't. If they didn't have that, that, that inside track. And unfortunately, that's part of school sport as well. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, you did post something on Facebook this week that I quite enjoyed. You went and looked at some of the old star um, school sports uh, uh, front pages. And the one I, I really enjoyed was the one with Kikis Rabat at the end of the Kai Majora week when um, he actually won the, that final game between him and West, between Khartoum and Western Province with the bat. I think he hit 42 off, not out of very few balls. Well, he, 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 they needed, I think they needed, they needed three off the last ball and he hit a six mm. to win the game, something like that. It was so exciting and amazing and he, and, and he, and he made a, a fair score. He was and still is and will one day be, I hope, a damn good batsman. You know, obviously he doesn't spend enough time on his batting, but he's he certainly had the technique and the and he's got the he's got the sporting ability. Well, that's got one of the most yeah, beautiful yeah. cover drives in, in world cricket. Um, we see that every now and again in a test match where one of the bowlers over pitches the ball and he puts it straight through covers and it's a beautiful cover drive. Um, but I don't think he gets much of an opportunity anymore. It's a pity. Yeah. Now, the problem with, especially with the fast bowlers, is they don't, they, they, they bowl a couple of overs in the net and then, they, and then they have to rest. 
Let's say, Alex, you go and bet. Yeah. Anyway, so interesting, yeah. Yeah, so let's, let's look at uh, one of your most, most recent blog posts. Um, and it, it's, it's a kind of like recurring kind of thing which uh, you and I talk about. Um, I mean, we've spoken about these kind of things quite often in different uh, forums. We've had, even at some of those party camps we've gone to, we've actually heard top, top coaches or uh, ex-professional players like a gay person stuff talking about the same kind of things. Um, what do you think were some of the, the pros and some of the good things and some of the bad things that were going through uh, sport, school sports in general um, prior to the lockdown? Yeah, I think, you know, my, my biggest problem that I have with it was the polarization or the, the division in, in schools. And we're talking mainly about rugby because that's what I know about cricket to a certain extent as well. A, a division into, into a, an ever decreasing circle of top schools. Uh, and they are getting stronger and stronger. They, are, they, they perform professionally. You know, the trend that, that, um, that we're seeing now, or that we saw prior to the lockdown, I think a lot's going to change, and this may be one of the things that will change, was, was the, <clears throat> the, the weird way in which top coaches use senior provincial coaching, the curry cup, and, and even... Super rugby in one or two cases. They use that as a stepping stone to get a top position as a coach at a school, which is totally weird. I mean, it shouldn't go that way, but it has. And you look at those top schools and you see, you know, you speak about Peter de Villiers, um, uh, Peter Rousseau, Stop Chips, Peter Rousseau, eh? yeah. it was, it was Paul Jim, who was, who was assistant coach of the Blue Bulls for many years and, and ends up coaching there. Hans could see a you know, was the coach of the Lions and went back to Monument. Brian Pinar coached the Blue Bulls and, and then went to Water Club. So you're getting these top coaches who, who end up coaching at schools, uh, top provincial coaches. And when, okay, th th that's the one side of it. But it's just the general professionalization. Those, those schools, and that's why those coaches are attracted there, those schools run a, run a, a rugby program that is superior to what's going on in the provinces because they're throwing a lot of money at it and they've got the space and they've got the talent and um, they, they run fantastic programs. They've got, they've got the gyms, they've got the fields, they've got the strength and conditioning coaches, they've got the dietitians, um, they've got the boys for, for many hours during the week because they, you know, they're sort of captive there. That's part of the problem. They then make them specialize in rugby. So they're not getting the benefits of an all round sporting education, which traditionally has always been that you, you play at least one sport in the summer, one in the winter, <clears throat> and even more. You end up; these kids now end up playing just rugby, and uh, I don't think it's 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 sound. It's not. It's certainly not physiologically sound or psychologically sound for a boy to specialise in one activity and and spend so much time and effort on it so early in his life. You know, the, the physiologist and the sports psychologist, child psychologist, will tell you that. And there are just so many examples of top, top sportsmen around the world who played lots of different sports when they were young. They didn't specialize in rugby or cricket at the age of 15. And yet the schools now, those sort of schools, we're expecting them to do it. Uh, and it all comes down to the prestige that the school gets from having a top rugby team. If, if your first rugby team is strong, and of course there are the rankings now with the, with the school rugby websites, and to get a top 10 ranking or to be regarded as a top school in the country has become very important and it adds great prestige to the school. And so that becomes very important. And so you have to then invest in, in, in that team so that you get... And so winning is very important. It's not, a, um, it's not a, a, an option to lose. I saw a, an article now of the, of the great college coach who may be leaving to go to, to the Blue Bulls. And uh, they spoke about how he went to great college at a time when the school's fortunes were, flat, were not great, when were great, didn't have a great season. I can't remember the year, but I looked at it. Great college lost three games. They lost to, they lost to, to Paul Boys High, to Paul Ruiz Gymnasium, and to Uffies, I think. I mean, that's not... <laughs> By any stretch of imagination, a bad season. But yet, that's the sort of those are the standards that those schools are setting for themselves. And so, winning becomes so important. 
So winning becomes the value by which you're operating your, your program. And you have to win. And so it soon becomes, you could call it, win at all costs. And when you're winning at all costs, it means just that. Then the other things, the socialization of the kids, the enjoyment they should actually be getting out of it, the physical development and the psychological development that they've got, that they get out of mixing with different boys and doing different activities, all of that falls by the wayside because you have to win. And then from there, it's a short step, and I'm not accusing anyone. Obviously, I can't, I don't know, but it's a short step then to start going for sharp practices, to start uh, asking the boys to bark up, like, uh, you know, invite, or they themselves do it because of the pressure they're under. So, so the, 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 the dietary supplements they buy at, 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 the, at the pharmacies and they eat that, and uh, that stuff's not regulated. And that, it shows remarkable results. Those guys suddenly grow, grow, you know, they suddenly bulk up by 10, 15 kilograms in, in two or three months. And uh, that can't be good. And uh, then, of course, there the, the, are, oh, I mean, let's face it, there are allegations that some of the guys are taking performance-enhancing drugs as well. So there, are, there is steroid use in our schools. I mean, the testing at the Crave Week showed that. I don't know how rife it is, but it exists, and it, and it comes about from this absolute obsession with winning. You have to win. And then the other big, big one, and, it, and, it, and it's been in the news this year big time, is that because you, because you set up this wonderful program, this wonderful professionally run rugby program, you've got to have good players to put into the program. I mean, you can't just, you can't, no point in going to that kind of spending all the money on the gym and the equipment and the program and hiring the top ex, ex uh, provincial coaches and then only expecting them to work with a, with a normal group of standard sixes who might arrive next year. So you go and look for them. You start recruiting them. And uh, you look at your team after you've done all your recruitment and the players have come through and you look at your team in grade 11 or even grade 8 and you say grade, uh, grade 10 and you say, well, we need a lock. We, you know, we, need, we need a couple of big props. So then you go and find them. You go and find them from other schools. And uh, in the process, you offer them. You offer them great bursaries. They go into a great program. Their chances of becoming top players are better, although there's no guarantee that they'll make it, and, and most of them obviously don't. But you're taking the top players out of, out of the schools that they come from, and uh, you without caring what the effect is on that school. And so their program is no longer successful. The teachers and the boys become dispirited, and eventually rugby disappears, and that's what's happened. So as I said, you've got an ever-decreasing circle of top, top schools, and the, rest, and the game is going backwards in the rest of the, in the, rest of the schools. And that can't be good for rugby. Uh, it's good for those schools and it's good for those boys and it's good for people like you and me who love school rugby. We can go on a Saturday morning and we can see fantastic games or we can watch them on television, but it's not doing the game of rugby any good. And uh, that's, my, that's my biggest beef. Then because everyone's chasing after those same boys, you have to get them early, catch them earlier and earlier. And then we get the situations we had this year that you find that, that 11 and 12-year-olds in primary school are now being lured and their primary school fees are paid for and on the condition that they go to a particular high school, which they didn't do. Uh, <laughs> that's why it made the news. I mean, that's ridiculous. How can you be, how can you be contracting 11, 12-year-olds? And, and it's so stupid because what, what guarantee do you have that they are going to actually develop into good players in, in five or six years' time? And then even worse, as, as, as you know, happened this year, we discover that the only reason why those boys, ones that were chosen by this particular school, the only reason why they were, why, why they stood out amongst their peers is because they were six or seven years older than them. And uh, I mean, the whole thing is just tumbling out of control. And that's my point that I think I'm trying to make in that blog. And, and one of the, one of the, one of the, the unintended blessings of the, of the coronavirus and the shutdown of rugby. Is I've been calling for, for, for a rebooting of the system for a long time, but it was never going to happen because the schools are just too caught up in it. And, and you take a break out, you take a break from it, or you decide one year you're not going to recruit players, you're not going to give bursaries, and you fall so far behind that you'll never catch up again. But that's why those kids are being 
brought into primary schools because by the time the primary school Craven Week comes along in the mid-year, all the top players are already burst, already have bursaries. They're already contracted to the to the to the to certain schools. So if you want to get in, you've got to get in the year before. You've got to make sure then already that you you're getting in. So you're chasing after these kids, you know, and you're getting deeper and deeper into the mire. So now we've hit a stage where boom, it's all stopped. And when it comes back, who knows how it's going to be? They're not going to have the money. These schools are, 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 are assuming, or the old boys or the trust funds or the people who are funding these things, everyone's going to be in financial difficulty. And uh, I think it might just tone down a bit. I don't think they, schools are not going to be able to, to, to spend two or three or 10 million. No, they do. Some of them spend that much on their, on their rugby program. Where's that money going to come from? The parents are, are not going to be prepared to fund it anymore. The businesses are not going to sponsor it anymore. We've seen that already. I mean, the sponsorship the sponsorships are disappearing and uh, things might change. And that was my point that maybe we'll go back to the old days where the school was, a, was part of the community and the kids in the community went to the school and the teachers at the school took the boys and chose teams out of them and did their best to coach them. And then you went and played against your neighboring schools. And sometimes you won and sometimes you lost. But in the process, you were trying your best to, produce good human beings who are going to learn from the lessons that sports teaches them. That's my, that's what my hope. I might be dreaming, but it could happen. It could, could very well happen. Um, you know, it's hard because it, you can't really, in, in some sense, you can't blame the schools for doing what they're doing because they need to attract, they, they use their sport, and it doesn't matter what sport it is, as a, as a marketing ploy to get, um, more kids and to get more people and more sponsorship for the schools because I mean, the government's funds are limited as is. So they can't spend as much money as what they'd like on, on schools like they used to or on certain schools like, that, like they used to do. They don't have to share the money out about, uh, amongst a lot more schools. So schools have to try and attract um, some kind of sponsorship to keep up. Like if you go to a kids or a, or a GP or a great college, you've got beautiful fields, beautiful facilities, but there's a huge cost to that. And therefore, they, they need those those powerful teams. But then there's a there's the other thing that they it doesn't benefit other schools, or it, it you know there's always a give and take between you know what you do and what you what you can do and what you can't do. Um, I like that that what you're talking about with the, the playing multiple sports because in your, you're talking about your highlights or, or your career. You actually mentioned two guys um, out of the sports doing exceptionally well in a sport that wasn't the sport they actually took on as their professions. And that was um, Nicky Boyer and um, uh, um, uh, Herschel Gibbs. Herschel. He spoke about them both in rugby. Both, um, uh, and Nicky Boyer actually took the place of a guy who went on to play for Springboks. Um, as a rugby player, you know, he ended up playing for the Proteus as, as, a, as a cricketer. So it just shows you how I can, how I can do well. And, and more recently, you look at... at uh, batches ruined the swap. I mean, that stamina that he brought playing rugby has certainly helped his cricket out. And he chose his cricket. He could have gone either way. Or uh, um, you look at uh, the Travis Gordon. If it wasn't for, uh, I mean, he's a phenomenal player. But those ball skills that he learned, he learned from playing uh, water polo. It's, you don't learn those kind of skills. That, I mean, his hands are like suction cups. That can, he, he never drops a ball. Um, and all these things come from playing multiple sports. Besides for the physical side of it, you got the technical side of your, your the sport that you choose is ben gets benefits from other sports that you play. Um, yeah, so you, you also can, now, so you say um, like the future of sport being a community because the schools have formed their own communities. And I think you also discussed this in your article how the school itself is a community. So kids want to become part of that community and move to that school. And so the school actually being the community that's around it, and the reflection community that's around it. The school is its own separate community. And through that, you've got your different ways of educating the kids. You say, you, you talk about systems where people don't have time to bring up the kids like they used to, because both parents are working, are working long hours and stuff. So you actually kind of take your kids, drop them at school and say, okay, well, this is a system, this is a place. You've got your sport, you've got your academics, you've got your cultural side, you've got life skills, everything at school. You guys sort out the kids and give, give them, kind of give them back to us really, really fixed, really in place and coached and trained. 
So I mean, school has changed a lot in the, since you know, year two, the late seventies to now. It's, it's completely different. Yeah, well, I think you know the thing that's changed is the school. You know, obviously that model that I was speaking about, the school in the centre of the community, changed when when po when populations moved, and uh, so you're finding many of the top schools around the country, the top state schools, are in areas of the cities which are no longer big population areas in terms of of young parents with kids. So they're getting their kids from, from further afield. Uh, even those who don't have hostels, kids are, are being bussed and, and, uh, and brought in. So, so it's, it's, not a, a, it's not a community in, in that sense. However, it is a community in, in the sense <clears throat> that you, you get your intake of boys and you get them every year. You get 200 boys into grade, grade eight and they go into 19, and they go through the next act. And that becomes your community. And, and the kids at the schools love, you know, I still work with schools now, with boys' schools in Joburg, and, and that, they always talk about the brotherhood, about the fact that we formed a fa about the family feeling. And that's a very powerful thing. It can, in some cases, be, be misused, and, and you get problems as well. But generally speaking, if it's well, if it's well managed, and it's the teachers who have to manage it. It's, it's adults in the system that have to manage it. That can be a very powerful, positive part of the growth of those kids. That's the community I'm speaking about. And the teachers who are there every day and who work with those boys, they're part of that community as well. They're the leaders of the community. With the principal, of course, the boss of it all, who has to really, he's got, he or she has got to be the person who really drives it. And that's fine. And then you, you, you have your school ethos, you have your your educational philosophy, which hopefully is a positive way, and you bring up those boys, you raise those children along those lines, and you use rugby, because that's what you're talking about, as one of the tools to do that, because rugby just lends itself so well to teaching those sorts of lessons. But if you're going to make, if you're going to make the reason why you've got rugby in your school so that you can win matches, you can get prestige, you can draw sponsorship, you can go on television. If that's the reason why you're playing rugby, then, then, you're, you, then you're perverting that whole thing. You're no longer using rugby as, as part of the tools to, to raise your community. And then, you, and then you, you're discarding members. Remember, my community I must look after. We're all part of this. But we, d we happen to have too few big locks this year, so we'll go fix them from somewhere else. And the members of our community who, who are there and who've been playing lock in, 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 in under 14, under 15, under 16, are tough. They're no, no longer big enough. They never, they never developed. And so a boy is brought from a different school. And that guy's just discarded. And he goes and plays seconds or thirds. And, uh, and that's, not, that's not the message you want to be sending out. And then you bring in professional, professional coaches, highly qualified top ex-players, et cetera, et cetera, who are not members of the community. They are not teachers. And, and, and they're there and they're being paid well because the teams must win. That's their job. Their job is to make the teams work. And they're very good at it at our top schools. But is that part of the community raising the children? I speak about in that blog, I, I think is it there where I say, we're so fond of saying it takes a village to raise a child, but yeah. we're not doing that. The village isn't raising the child. We are outsourcing part of it to professionals, and they're in it to make money. And yeah. once you start doing that, then you're on shaky ground. So, I mean, one of the things that we've been doing and you know, looking for you know, press releases for our different clients and things like that, and I mean, you've been very much involved in it too, is that we look for like lessons that can be learned through sport because you know, we all talk about the first team. But there's the other 50 teams in the school that are also important and what lessons can be learned there. And I mean, through Denon uh, last year, we found a lot of examples of um, the benefit of having a school teacher as a coach where the teacher finds certain problems with the kid, especially in primary school and the kid in class, and then takes the kid out into the, the um, football field. And they can teach them certain aspects of life and, and help them out and help them with their confidence and help them with certain things that eventually leads back to the classroom again. So now they've a calmer kid, a, a kid that helps in the classroom. Now, getting a professional coach, and especially from the younger age groups, you kind of lose it out. However, I don't want to 
write off the professional coaches either because there, there's a place for them too. So there's got to be some kind of interaction between the professional coaches and the, the school teachers or the school teacher leading onto the sports field where they can communicate and they can say, listen, look out for this kid. He's got family problems at home. He needs a bit of a, uh, or he or she needs a, a role model you know, in the sporting field. Just be a bit sensitive to what they're doing and the coach knows how to, how to get the best of that child. Um, because that's the other side, is getting the best out of your players right through business and learning about businesses. The people talk about how you need to get the best out of a player. Uh, a best of uh, uh, somebody in the office, and you have people with different personalities, different cultures, different uh, ways of thinking. But if you tap into what works in each one of them, they can all work together. You don't have to say, okay, well, this guy's not working, let's get rid of him and get the next, play, next person in. Um, I, I've just watched that um, documentary on the Chicago Bulls. And you start off with Michael Jordan, and you go to Scotty Pippen, Scotty Pippen's problems, and then you get to real problems with the Dennis Rodman. And instead of the team turning around and saying, this guy is just a loose cannon, this guy is just he's such a, a different guy, we can't manage him, we don't know how he works, they pretty much sat there and said, okay, well, he works different to the rest of us. How can we suit, How can we change our ways to let him have his blocks, his days when he just needs to be sent away? And he comes back and he appreciates that and gives 100 times more than what he gave beforehand because you respected him as a person. So, you know, there's all these kind of lessons that you learn, and it's, it's, it's so easy to kick out a player and bring another player in because they perform well for the week. But there's other ways to deal with people. And at school, you can learn that. It's an easy place to learn these kind of managerial skills or interpersonal skills on the sports field. Yeah, I agree. And I agree with you. I mean, uh, the, 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 the professional coaches bring the expertise, the technical expertise, and they make the game better and they make the players better. And that's a good thing. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with that. And some of them are great educationists, even though they may not be teachers. I'm not writing them all off. But they have to be managed, especially the younger ones, as you say. <clears throat> Typically, schools would get old boys, ex-pupils from the recent years, to come and coach their junior teams. And those guys come in with this, this gung-ho, win-at-all-costs attitude. And that's unhealthy. And I've seen plenty of that you know, through the years. And they're not being managed properly by the, by, the, by the senior people in that school. You need both. You need a balance between the two. You need the, you need the t- testosterone and the energy and the drive and the ambition of the youngsters. But you also need the wise old heads to manage the process, and to pull them back and to say to them, listen, guys, and that's my point. Whatever we do, and, and th- this is non-negotiable, whatever we do in this place has to be educational. That's why we are. We're not here to win rugby games. We are to be educational. Winning rugby games is an educational, you know, it can be used educationally. And losing rugby games can be used educationally. But winning is not the only aim. And certainly not winning at all costs. I think in, in my experience when I played at school, uh, one of the good examples of a, he came in as a coach, but um, and he, never, he, he actually, he always coached the, the most junior level of high school, and that was our Tati father. And he got to know the kids very well, and he played that fatherly kind of uh, figure. And he never moved up from the, the, that age group. We always coached the same age group, but it was always great to have him because he was an introductory phase. He understood the kids. He got to know each one of us personally. He, you know, he, he actually did perform the ball very well and he was an outside coach. But then you look at a guy like um, Arthur Dematis and he's a coach and teacher and does the exact same role in a different sport for than what Tati did and also performs exceptionally well. And I think there's more teachers like, like uh, Arthur that can do that than an external person like Tati. Yeah, I think, you know, again, in my years of experience, you, you got both. You certainly had... Outsiders, who I said some of them were brilliant educators, even though they weren't teachers. You got teachers who, who, were, who were overambitious. And so, you know, it's not, a, it's not a hard and fast rule. But generally speaking, it's preferable, I think, to have a teacher. And, and it doesn't happen so much anymore because teachers, there are fewer men teachers. Teachers are now more um, focused on academics. They're not as willing to spend the time on the field. And that's a pity. And, and, and we've reached the stage where we now have to, have to do what the things you said to get the sponsorship, to get the money, so that you can pay outsiders because you haven't got teachers to do it. And that's why I'm saying we need a reset. We need to get a stage where we say, listen, guys, 
there aren't, we have, there's no money to pay these guys from the outside anymore. We've got to start encouraging our teachers. And if you've got good leadership in the school and you manage the youngsters properly, the young teachers, you can use them. I'm involved in a school where, where that happens, where, 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 where there are a lot of young men teachers and they will coach. And every team, every team has a teacher. There are also some outsiders, but, you know, they, they are, and, you know, CARES is the same. They have a high percentage of teachers who actually coach, and they, they use outsiders too. But uh, there has to be a balance, and there has to be an educational approach to it. And there hasn't been. There hasn't been, unfortunately. We've got too carried away with winning, and, we, and, and national competitions, and top school days, and, uh, and world school festivals. And things like that. I see one local school here in Joburg is planning to have a world school tournament next year. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, to be planning something like that in the middle of the coronavirus is bizarre, in my view. Anyway. Uh, now, as you're talking about that, you, you bring up something that the original Craven Week, the re what Donnie Craven's original idea about Craven Week wasn't for the most powerful teams to play each other in the, at the end of the day, it was for the most attractive rugby. So his idea was a festival of rugby, not uh, and and all these tournaments have actually ended up being a, a a final at the end, even though it shouldn't be considered as a final. They well, it's not an official final. They actually are pretty much finals. But the original idea wasn't a final. So, but there's, yeah, I mean, no, no, that's that's it. You've got some festivals like that, like St. Stephen's and Cares and um, St. John's festivals. They, they become more enjoyable festivals. Or I think you've got quite a few water polo or hockey festivals that are just exhibitions of the game. Yeah. yeah the, 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 the Craven Week the, and even the Coca-Cola, uh, no longer Coca-Cola, the Kaimajola Week have become, have become tournaments as opposed to festivals. They have a main game. There's no semi-final process to get there, but basically there is. Everyone knows that, and it's become, and that's, and that's again because television requires that, and uh, it, it, we've been sucked into that kind of thinking that that's more important than the other things that come from it. And uh, I think the the Easter festivals have been um, have been more educational, but they you know they under threat. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised. If we don't have them for very much longer, they're battling for sponsorship. The Standard Bank sponsorship for those tournaments ends. This would have been the last year. I don't know if they'll go on for another year next year, seeing they didn't have this year. But um, And the top schools, the very top schools, that little circle I was speaking about, they're no longer interested in going to those festivals because there are other, there are these two-day rugby, the Nordseit and the Volderklava, these big, big tournaments Festivals also, but at which all the top schools are there. And they're not, they're not afraid to match two of the, you know, the number two and three ranked school in the country. They'll match them at those tournaments. And, 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 and as a result of that match, they'll say, right, we are the best school in the country this year. Or we are the number two school. People want that. That's, that those are the things that people want out of it. And that's fine. But it, it, it only involves the first team players. It only involves the, the top elite players in the school. It's not rugby. It's not, the, it's not using the sport of rugby as part of the educational process in the school. And that's what I'm calling for. Uh, so, and then um, other sports, um, I mean, you've got a huge passion for water polo, but other sports have suffered a little bit and uh, that this aim that certain sports have got to be, um, there's got to be more focus on certain sports and also because there's a professional um, and leads afterwards, so there's a future for those guys in those sports. But um, sports like water polo and stuff have really struggled, and basketball have really struggled under, you know, this kind of system, isn't it? Well, they're, they're, they're incredibly popular. I mean, those you took, uh, girls' water polo and boys' basketball in our schools are the fastest growing sports, without a doubt. I mean, th those are the, are the sports that the kids want to play. and uh, And there's not a lot of, lot of money in there. There's not a lot of publicity, and yet the sports are incredibly popular. And the kids enjoy them. They enjoy playing basketball. You go, and go to a Saturday morning to a boys' school and watch the basketball games, you'll see the kids are having a tremendous amount of fun. And the first team matches are very competitive, but it's a, it's a fun thing. 
And the same with water polo, especially amongst the girls. I mean, it's, 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 it's a different, there's just a different tone and level, a, a different feeling about those matches compared to rugby. And it's because they haven't become professionalized, because there's not a lot of money. I don't think bringing all this money into the, into the game at school level is a good thing. I don't think it's done the, the game any service. And that's why I come back to my point that if at the end of all of this, there's not as much money left to, to, to plow into the sport of rugby at school level, then that might just be a good thing.